Thank you, Brother Bill. Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been in Matthew chapter number 9, or I guess this is the second week that we're getting back into it. And I want to start off by reading verses 1 through 9, or 1 through 8, as we look into these verses again this week. It says, And he entered into a ship, and passed over, and came to his own city. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their fate, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes within, said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise and take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power in the men. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your good grace and mercy. And once again, I ask, Lord, that you'll help us as we look into your word. And Lord, I do humble myself before you, realizing I'm just a man in need of a touch from thee. And Lord, we love you. We want to serve you and do the best we can for you. Ask, Lord, that you'll bless and have your way as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Two weeks ago, we looked at uh, this gentleman that has the palsy and how he could not go anywhere. He was bore on a bed by four others that... that uh, and that carried him to Jesus. There's no doubt in his mind we discussed it, that his desire was to, to be healed. But it was not just a physical healing that he was looking for, but he was looking for a, a healing from his sins. And you say, how do you know that? Because his very disease was that by which man called sin. Because he was in the condition that he was in, he was considered a man of, of sin, that he had been, that he was a sinner, that he had done something tremendously wrong, and God had judged him and made him uh, to be in the position that he was in. You say, how do you know that, Brother David? Well, the Bible says that, it, that Jesus' disciples was talking about a blind man one day and said, is this man blind because of a sin that he's done or the sin of his father's? And it was neither one. He was blind for the glory of God, and God was going to do a great miracle for him. But the attitude of that day was that if there's something wrong with you, you are a sinner, and you, you had sinned a great sin before God. And surely he held in this understanding of his own condition as he was bore there by these men. His desire was to see Jesus but when they got to the house, what an impossibility. I mean, I want to tell you something. We talk about reunions having 50 people around, but can you imagine Jesus being in a house, healing people, and the multitudes of those people coming from miles around, following him from everywhere he went. I mean, he was... He was on one side healing people, and then he crossed over to the other side, and it says that little boats followed him over there, and now he's gone back to the other side, and surely little boats followed him back over there. And, and you're talking thousands of people that were around that little house. And these four men come bearing this man on a bed. Could you imagine... Uh, the World Series in Atlanta. I mean, it's taking place, but can you imagine coming to the place where the traffic starts 
to the Braves Stadium. And you've got to get in there because in there is all the hope that you've ever had in all your life. But you're like 20 miles from the stadium and the traffic is bumper to bumper. And you said, man, I ain't got a ticket yet. I think I'll just turn around and go home. This is too much traffic for me to sit in. It's an impossibility for me to get there. I mean, that's a, that is the that is a kind, kind, of, kind of condition that they were in, that it was, it was an impossibility, these men. But their faith showed through. They did not let the multitude stop them. Matter of fact, they went up to the top of the roof. We, when we think about going up to the top of the roof, we think about just some nice stairs that lead up to, to a building on the, on the side or in, inside of a house that leads all the way up to the top. But probably it was on the back side of that house they had a, 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 a ladder that was leaned up to the, to the back of it that led all the way up to the top of it. And as those men dragged that man up that ladder to the top of the roof, like they were, their endurance was to get him to Jesus. It, it, I mean, it was, it was so important for them to be able to do that if they were willing to go through whatever it took to get him there. Sad today that the world's dying and going to hell and, and we won't even give out a track. We worry about all the things that we've got to get done today instead of what we are to be telling people. But these four men showed a great faith. Now I want you to realize that in the midst of all this, there's not a word being said. The four men that are, that are there, they're not crying out to Jesus, Jesus, this man needs to be healed. The man that has palsy, he, he might not even be able to say anything. And I'm grateful that Jesus knew their heart. He knew their spirit. He knew their need. And I believe that's one of the reasons that he said in, in verse number two, thy sins be forgiven. Thy sins be forgiven. What a remarkable understanding. As we look at the heart of these men, the heart of him that was sick, and the heart of the scribes that were there standing by. And the thing about it is, Jesus could read everybody's heart there. He knew the, the desire of the man that was in the bed was to be forgiven. I believe that's why he said it so the man would know that his sins were forgiven. Not that he was just physically healed, but his sins were forgiven. The Pharisees, he read their heart too. So we sell their faith as they journeyed up. But then we come to another word that I want us to look at tonight. And that's the word forgiveness. Forgiveness. Thy sins be forgiven. The request, before it was even asked, was made. The giver of all good things gave the, the greatest gift that could ever be given. Thy sins be forgiven before anybody even spoke. The remission of sins that the Bible talks about, this is a salvation. The forgiveness, full and complete. He said, forgiven. And when the Lord said that, our, his, their sins went away, or his sins went away. You know how far they went? As far as the east is from the west. 
He buried him in that sea. Psalms 103 says that he remembers them no more. Aren't you grateful for that? I like what Paul said. Who hath before, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but obtained mercy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectations. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Forgiveness. When missionaries went to Alaska, they took the gospel. But in the Eskimo language, as they desired to translate the word of God into their language, they come across a great problem. They found that there was no word in the, in the uh, Eskimo language to say forgiveness. And they were stuck. They had no understanding of how to, to, to relay the Christian message because the Christian message is that of forgiveness. But they found that in, that in the Eskimo language, there was a very interesting phrase. It was, it was a one-word phrase. And when I tell you it's a one-word phrase, this word is about like this long. I'm going, to, I'm going to attempt to, to say it just so you can understand how long this word is. That's a mouthful. But he, they, they found this word. And this word was not just a simple one word. It was a phrase. And this phrase was a word that was used in the Mexican, I mean, in the, in the Eskimo language. And it meant not being able to think about it anymore. And everywhere throughout the Bible that where they translated forgiveness, they would put this word. And it, re it relayed to them that their sins in God's eyes was not thought about anymore. And that was forgiveness for them. What a remarkable word that became. The Lord gave himself the greatest gift. It means that he dealt for us the greatest deed. In the depths of humanity lost in sin, your sin are forgiven. Is what he gave us on that tree. This is the message of all Christianity. It is a message of forgiveness of sin. People say, oh, you shouldn't say nothing about sin. It brings a negative understanding, negative thinking. But the forgiveness of sin, my friend, is what we're to preach. And if we don't preach against sin, how can we preach the forgiveness of it? The very message that we're called to, to give out, if we leave the sin part out, we betray the very call by which we're called to preach. The Bible says that man is a sinner, a transgressor of the law. Sin is a defilement. It has, it has blotted out God's image and stained our souls. Sin had planted in us the devil's image, and we have become his children. Sin is a rebellion against God. The Bible says, can a leopard change his spots? Says Jeremiah. Then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. There's no way that we could change, for we are what the Bible says. We're sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is the deepest heart, in, is in the deep of, of the heart of man. Even the regenerated man 
wrestles and fights against sin. There is no freedom on this side from sin. There is only forgiveness. Sin dominates the mind, perverts the will, uh, it stains the affections, pollutes the body, it brings men under the, the dominion of Satan, it brings men under the power of the wrath of God, sin subjects men to, to misery as, as that he is born, as the Bible says, to trouble as the sparks fly upward. To that he is subject to an emptiness that is in him. There's no peace, and his doom is hell. That's what sin brings. And if this be true, then the best news that we can ever give is that God forgives. God forgives sin, and he bore man's sin on Calvary. I believe that when he healed this man and said, Thy sins be forgiven, his mind went back to Calvary. And a taste of the cross that he would bear became fresh in his mind as he knew the punishment that he would bear for the helpless soul of humanity, for the forgiveness of sin. So faith and forgiveness must be two things that we focus on as we look into this portion. The forgiveness of sin that is there for mankind. But there's a third word I want you to see. It's found in verse, no, we, we see the evidence of it in verse number three. It says, and, before, and behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. I'm so grateful that the Lord was able to read their hearts. They didn't say this out loud. They thought it in their mind. In Luke, it tells us that the Pharisees were of Jerusalem were there too. In Mark, it says that they, that, that they said first, who can forgive sins but God only? This man blasphemeth. The crippled man desired forgiveness. All these men concluded that he was a blasphemer. Isn't that something? In the mixed multitude, they were those who were desiring to believe and those who were willing to reject. Isn't that the same everywhere we go? The difference is one desired forgiveness and the other needed it not. They saw no need of their own selves. They saw themselves as righteous, without want. Isn't it funny that at the end of the church age in the book of Revelation, the, the church of Laodicea has the same character, that they have plenty, that they're in need of nothing. They become that Pharisaical church by which the Pharisees were of. They won't acknowledge it. It's sort of like the woman that was caught in adultery. That as they brought her to Jesus, the Pharisees and scribes were there, and Jesus offered forgiveness. Not just for her, but for also for them. For their sins were placed on, on trial that day too, as he said, ye that have sinned not, cast the first stone. But each one of them left, not receiving forgiveness of their own sins. Turned in shame and left that place. But there was one there that stayed. And the Bible says that Jesus said, go and sin no more. She found forgiveness that day. Oh, we can preach the message of forgiveness, and there'll be some that stay, and there'll be some that will not. Some will open their hearts to Christ, and some will receive, and some will reject and refuse it. This is the problem that we face. 
if they are not willing to accept forgiveness. And instead of saying that I'm guilty, I need my sins forgiven. My soul is polluted before the Lord. They say, not now. I don't want it. I don't believe it. And they carry their own sins. Only God can for forgive sin. This is not something man can do. With their own voices, they, de they, they declared unto those that, um, with their own minds, they declared to themselves that Jesus was God. For truly, they were right in that fact. Only God can forgive sin. But they did not see him as God. They said he is a blasphemer. And yet, that man took up his bed and went home. The evidence of, of his actions was there before them, and they still refused it. Isn't it something that in our lives we can, we can reveal the word of God to the place that is so clear to people, and yet they'll refuse it and live in their own sin? God's the only one that can forgive sin. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. God can forgive sin and God alone. They were right about that, but they were wrong about Christ. He was not a blasphemer. He was being declared the the uh, Messiah, the Son of God, God himself in flesh was there with them. Now, if you'll notice with me, and at verse number three says that they said it within themselves, even their hearts being read and God and, and Jesus revealing their thoughts did not ring them true in their minds to say we didn't say a thing, and yet we thought it. This mark that he was God, that he was able not only to heal, but he could read the minds of those that were there. The mind of that one that desired to be healed of the sin that, he, that was in his life, and the minds of those that were there to accuse him. When they said, this man blasphemed, they were just building the fire by which ultimately would lead to the crucifixion of Christ. In, in Matthew chapter number, in, in uh, chapter 9 and verse number 23, they called him a blasphemer. In Matthew uh, 9 verse number 11, it says, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why? Edith, your master, with publicans and sinners. And here they were accusing him of immorality, that he ran around with a bad crowd, so he must be a bad man. He's a blasphemer. He's immoral. In Matthew 9, 14, it says, And they and then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do, you, the, why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But thy disciples fast not. They came to him, his disciples, and they were accusing him of being irreligious. They were not that you're not following the normal uh, protocol. You're not following the normal procedures of religion. So they accused him of being a blasphemer, of an immoral person that ran around. And that one that would not form to the religion that was at hand. This was that case that the Pharisees was building against Christ. And then when we come to Matthew chapter 9, verse number 34, the Pharisees described to him, it says that, they ca that he cast out demons through the prince of, of the devils. Can I tell you, their fury had mounted. 
They had come to a place where, where, where they were filled with fury against him. What a contrast. On one hand, there's faith and forgiveness. And on the other hand, their fury. And Christ is there in the middle. And that's the way it always is. Christ comes with a message of love, grace, and forgiveness. And they are those that, who will receive it and rejoice in it. And then there are those who will hate it, despise it, and become furious by it. That is the gospel. And it was there in that day when Jesus walked this earth. Let us not be deceived to think it's not in our day too. That if we'll stand true and we'll be faithful and we'll preach the gospel according to the word of God, there'll be those that will rejoice in it, but then there'll be those that will become furious by it and will not want to receive it. Oh, that we would be that one that would stand true to the word of God, reveal the faith, preach the forgiveness, and let things lay where they lay, no matter who gets hurt. Well, there's still more to come, but that's all we have for tonight. Let's stand together. Father, I do thank you so much for your grace and mercy. I ask, Lord, that you would help us as we, as we look into these verses to know that, that they were those that were there that day to really receive you, to really, to really get that that you had for them. But they were those there that day that would not, no matter what took place, no matter the, the great miracle that was before them, even the condemning of their own thoughts could not convince them that Jesus is a forgiver of sin. Lord, I pray today that this, as we go out and, Lord, as we give out tracts and as we talk to people, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself in such a manner that they would have to see who you are. Lord, we love you and thank you for all you do for us. And Lord, as we look further on in these scriptures, I pray that you would reveal greater things to us. And we'll praise you and give you the honor and glory of it. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Bill, what we're going to sing? Number 219, He Needeth Me. Two, nine.